Hello, everybody. Yeah. First of all, thank you for your time in advance. It's a pleasure to be here and to open the first PyData Helsinki uh, conference and meetup. Um, I would quickly share my screen. All right. So my name is Osan Gencholo. I'm co-founder and head of AI at Top Data Science, leading about 20 data scientists at Top Data Science. We are we are a Helsinki-based uh, AI consultancy, and we solve our clients' problems with machine learning. And today I'll be talking about uh, best practices of data augmentation. I will be talking about, of course, first what data augmentation is if you if you are not familiar with that, and I'll be giving several examples of data augmentation in various domains such as computer vision, natural language processing, etc. So my outline will be as such. First, I'll introduce data augmentation and the scientific rationale behind it. Uh, I'll give a couple of remarks that is kind of generic to whatever data augmentation you are performing. And I will right away dive, dive into best practices I'll give examples from computer vision, what is the state of the art, what you should be actually be aware of, what you should be careful of. Similarly, in NLP, I will be mentioning a couple of cool tricks uh, in that in that domain and some uh, some examples and libraries in in a couple of other, let's say, modalities such as time series or tabular data. And then I will give a couple of um, a bit more advanced, maybe use cases of data augmentation uh, in in research as well as in the industry. So I play factual, meaning that I give, I try to give references, scientific references when I when I claim something. So if you see this green box somewhere down any slide, it means uh, that is the reference uh, publication. You can you can go further, have a read on. And if you see a red box, uh, it means it's a it's a library. For for this for this uh, meetup, I focused only on Python. So it, uh, in in red boxes, I will give the the Python library that you can perform. You can apply uh, those things told in that slide. So this is kind of the structure of of my slides. Okay, so let's right away dive into data augmentation. Meanwhile, you can uh, write your questions or comments in the chat part because we will have a question and answering session so that you don't forget. So data augmentation is basically um, increasing your training data size by diversifying your data. Uh, I would like you to focus on the diversifying your data training data more than increasing the training size part. Uh, I will elaborate a bit more on that. But basically, uh, if, 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 you, if you have run any kind of data science or machine learning projects, every company has at least one person, whatever you present, saying that just collect more data. And this is, this is where I believe data augmentation originated from, because we data scientists, we would like to we would like to get the work done uh, without actually doing too much hassle. So we want to get the job done without doing the work. So we, of course, obviously thought that how can we simulate uh, sampling from real, real data distributions? So sampling from nature, meaning collecting data programmatically in a in a synthetic way. Uh, partly automatically. So data augmentation means that basically introducing some noise, some perturbations, small changes to your training data so that you increase the diversity of your data, which helps in, in several aspects. So the scientific rationale is, uh, this talk is, is a, bit, a bit focused on neural networks and deep learning, but many of, thing, many of the things are also generic. But from, from a neural networks perspective, neural networks are uh, universal function approximators, uh, universal approximation theorem, meaning that you can basically fit any function perfectly, meaning that you can actually achieve zero training or error uh, with even single layer neural network. You don't need a deep neural network which is quite bad because we don't want zero training error. It doesn't mean that we will generalize. So these 
uh, these kind of methods and algorithms, machine learning models are very easy to overfit. And by diversifying your data, by increasing your training data size, you make the model, uh, you you give a hard time to the model to overfit. So actually, it, it serves as a regularization uh, purpose, actually. And uh, a bit, this is, I'm not going into details, but uh, the choice of data augmentation should, in general, uh, be taken care of depending on your data neural network architecture. Uh, for example, let's say convolutional neural networks, they are um, translation equivariant, meaning that an object on the left of the image shouldn't matter if it's on the right or left. So if you translate an object in the image, uh, the, the convolutional neural networks should be able to learn the representation of those. So maybe translation augmentation is not actually, it's a bit redundant made before uh, convolutional neural nets, these kind of things. And uh, typically state-of-the-art results are are achieved in, in, in research with data augmentation. So it's been a really, uh, common practice actually, both during time as well as during inference time, which we call test time augmentation, which I have a slide about. So a uh, couple of remarks. The focus, as I said, should be diversifying the data. And it's it's not a new concept in a sense that um, it's, it's pretty much rooted in sampling theory because you are trying to sampling, sample from a distribution hopefully resembling actual data distribution in nature. Uh, and this is very important. Your data augmentations in uh, optimally should, should be domain and task dependent. They are, and you should make use of that. So domain expertise when you are coming up with data, specific custom data augmentations is crucial. I will give examples about that. So if everything's all right, I would, I would right away dive into best practices. First, I will talk about best practices of generic data augmentation. These things apply to computer vision, uh, tabular data, uh, natural language processing, like text text data, etc. Then I will further on down into that kind of uh, modality-specific augmentations. So. Uh, the first thing I would like to recommend is use the domain knowledge when you select your augmentations or implement a custom augmentation. So domain knowledge means the task at hand usually, almost always, have certain kind of prior information or prior knowledge that's available to you or to the domain experts. And it's quite important to make use of that domain knowledge when you devise uh, basically your data augmentations. For example, um, let's say you are building an object detection model or an image classification model, etc., cetera, and um, the, you wanna put this into production where there's a camera, but the camera stream, you know, you know that the camera stream is giving you, let's say, JPEG images. JPEG is a comp uh, lossy compression, so it, it actually decreases the quality of the image. But your training data is all nice, high quality images. So what you should do is that using that knowledge that, hey, this camera, the security camera or whatever is kind of low quality and it's doing this compression, uh, I should augment my training data during training time with JPEG compression. It's, it's an augmentation technique so that the training data, statistical distribution of the training data resembles the statistical distribution of the data in production or test data, if you if you if you want to call that. Second example: Let's say you are doing a text classification. You have this text glycerol is a whatever. I just copied this from Wikipedia actually, and the label is biology. This text is about biology or chemistry. It can be, and as a chemist or a, or 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 as a as a biologist, you also know that glycerol has another name, glycerine or glycerin. Uh, and you would like to add these kind of uh, versions of the of your data as data augmentation so, so that you use the domain knowledge and increase the diversity of your training data. This was an example from, from natural language processing. 
second best practice please augment only the training data so we are we have training validation and holdout data so test data if you call it uh, we don't want to we don't want to augment the validation data so we augment the training data only uh, this is this is I, I hope this is makes sense to you. This is quite important to to have to have fair comparisons and uh, realistic estimation of errors actually when you put things into production. All right, continuing. So randomness is your friend, especially when you are training uh, neural networks. Um, we like randomness uh, or stochastic stochasticity, right? So. Uh, Neural network training is 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 a non-convex optimization problem. I will not go into details of, of this, uh, meaning that it's NP-hard, meaning that uh, you are you are not really actually searching for global minimum because it finding it is pretty damn difficult. So you are okay with local minima, uh, and the problem is uh, you get stuck there in local minima or in saddle points and uh, mon there are several several like this plethora of research that shows that when you when you do for example this batch gradient descent uh, uh, so you randomly select certain batch of data you don't like always give the same sequence of data you randomize things it eases for you to uh, to generalize more you can move from uh, this kind of saddle points or local minima easier. So this this is from a data augmentation perspective. It helps your training and uh, generalization power when you when you add more random. So make things more random. Which comes to the practice of it. So please do not augment your data and save it to a to your computer or to a database or hard drive and then train a model because um, even though you introduce you can introduce this augmentation with a probabilistic way so that it's random uh, it's also it's also like a kind of fixed once you create those actually augmented data and also you 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 actually use lots of storage space etc what we typically do is we augment on the fly while training a model so this is quite a good practice to have. So on the fly, you randomly, randomly, some part of the data is like uh, transformed, perturbed, whatever your augmentations is. Some part of the observations, some of the observations are augmented with certain probability with certain augmentations. So this kind of randomness on the fly, that's a good, that's a good practice. Um, it's important to profile your training. So typically data augmentations happens on CPU. Um, uh, and neural networks are, you train neural networks in, in GPU. So usually you shouldn't have speed bottlenecks because of augmentations, because usually the heavy part of training a model is, uh, is happening on the GPU and uh, flipping images or stuff like that shouldn't slow down your training. But, but if you have a custom augmentation, something you, something very computationally heavy, for whatever reason, you implemented this, it's important for your domain, let's say, uh, it may slow down actually your training. Uh, so uh, also realize that some augmentations can be actually done on GPU. And I, I believe this is kind of the path where, where where we are heading actually in the in the industry and in the research. So profiling the speed of your training, uh, turning on on and off the augmentations to see if it makes sense, it, it's a good practice. Um, now uh, I get lots of questions that, okay, which data augmentations to choose and their probabilities uh, aren't they hyperparameters? Technically, yes. So. Uh, which data type of data augmentation? It's a it's a categorical hyperparameter. If you you can choose from ten, like you can turn on and off each, so you have ten hyperparameters. Then each augmentation, let's say uh, the strength of rotation or how much you want to rotate the angle, that's a parameter of the uh, kind of augmentation itself. 
uh, then you if you want to assign separate proper different probabilities to each augmentation so this thing explodes right so uh, you don't want to do some hyperparameter optimization on every single this probability of this augmentation should be optimal we don't have that much time and computation power so kind of kind of simplify things right uh, so group group maybe type of augmentations for example from image or computer vision, rotation, shifting, uh, a fine transform or scaling, group them into geometric transformation category maybe. So they are happening together. Um, set the probability of each augmentation to a single value. Maybe, maybe you don't wanna have 0 0.2 for this, 0 0.35 for this. So it, it really explodes your search space. So keep it simple. Uh, play with the probability of you want to augment this sample with or not. Uh, play with that kind of strength of augmentation. Uh, this is kind of a way to simplify this whole data augmentation parameter tuning, if you if you want to call it. And finally, always visualize. This is like one of the most important things. Before training, always visualize, inspect manually. Does these augmentations make sense? Uh, look at your images, augmented images, look at your augmented text, uh, videos, etc. Uh, because you don't want to mess up your training. They should make sense. This is quite important. All right, let's dive into computer vision. So uh, very typical augmentations is changing the shuffling to color space, uh, affine transform, uh, or this kind of inverting the, inverting the actual color space. You can play with exposure, so lighting, lighting of the image. You can rotate, uh, and you can change the alpha channel, etc. These are these are pretty typical augmentations. You can add some noise, uh, salt and pepper noise, or other kinds of blur, uh, motion blur. You can add some domain-specific augmentations as well. Uh, something, something, uh, or JPEG compression. This kind of compression augmentations. Something. Uh, I really would like to recommend is this Albumentations library. Uh, I use it quite a lot with my team. Uh, of course, TensorFlow, PyTorch, other libraries have all their their internal internal let's say uh, data augmentation let's say functionalities. But Albumentations is is a, a well documented, uh, well growing library that has many many different au augmentations image augmentations in it. So feel free to check it out. Uh, the current state of the art um, in computer vision, kind of peer reviewed and published is uh, mix up, cut out and cut mix augmentations. So um, in mix up, you actually would like to mix several for, for image classification, right? Several, several, several classes together like you have your cat and the dog together. Cut out. You actually simply cut out a huge portion of 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 the of the image. And cut mix is actually you put put uh, an image from or a portion from from another class into it. So feel free to also check these check these if you if you want to try these out. Now I would like to emphasize if you if you have volumetric data, so three D data. For example, medical images like MR, CT, it's, it's, it's kind of slices of 2D images, meaning that you have a 3D structure. Uh, you should be careful when you are augmenting each slice. Actually, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't do that because uh, one slice here is augmented with this augmentation and the second slice is perturbed with another augmentation. You kind of, you kind of lose the whole 3D structure, right? So instead, use Torch Torch IO. Uh, I don't know if it's pronounced like that. A library, which actually, if you watch watch carefully, this is a movie. Like a uh, in 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 this slide, you can actually uh, modify the uh, modify the whole whole data with in a 3D manner without losing the 3D shape. So this is a cool library. Uh, and similarly for video, you wanna you wanna apply data augmentation to each frame, 
the same augmentation to each frame of a video so that you don't lose the you don't lose the logic there let's talk about nlp so you can have character level augmentations so you can for example insert some characters delete some characters or simulate keyboard errors that's so a typing error uh, you can have word level augmentations you can substitute some synonyms this is pretty common you can use a, another actually pre-trained model to insert some contextual words something like bird for example you can swap or delete words or you can have sentence level augmentations you can insert sentences using a uh, GPT-2 kind of models. You can shuffle sentences. Uh, you can create this kind of diversity. Uh, you can increase your training data size uh, with these kind of tricks. And NLP AUG is the library I, I used a couple of times. It's quite nice uh, for, for, for NLP augmentations. An example here, for example, if the original sentence is, sentence is a sad superior human comedy played out on the back roads of life, you can change sad with a synonym, lamentable. You can randomly inter insert some uh, words, swap some words, or delete some words. Uh, just just an illustration of how, how these things work. Uh, all right, so uh, one another trick in, in NLP is back translation. So you can translate your English into, for example, French and back translate to English, this gives some kind of variation, which is used nowadays quite a lot. Uh, and for time series, tabular and audio data, there are several libraries, DeltaPy, CTGAN, these are for, for tabular data. For example, CTGAN trains a generative model, uh, generative adversarial network out of your out of your tabular data and then you can sample actually uh, it, from that distribution to generate to augment uh, tabular data. Audio augmentations, you can use it to, to augment audio data. And I have a couple of slides left, uh, only a couple of other use cases. Uh, test time augmentation, if you see in a paper TTA, it means test time augmentation, meaning that during inference, during prediction time, you, would, you can actually uh, boost your model performance. For example, you can, you can, uh, pass through your model, you can predict several versions of the images, augmented versions of your image or your text and get your predictions and do some ensemble. Maybe you can do majority voting or uh, check the most, pick the one that is most confident or do some averaging of the probabilities, etc. So this usually, test time augmentation usually boosts, boosts up your, um, let's say model performance couple of percent so if you want to squeeze the most out of everything go go ahead and apply uh, obviously there's no free lunch so uh, the downside is that you need to infer you need to predict all those three for example augmentations meaning that you need to run predictions three times so your results will be you need to wait three times more so it will be slower then uh, some some recent papers actually published uh, turned this into a meta learning problem so trying to learn what is the best augmentation for 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 a given task so uh, using for example reinforcement learning this is a bit falling into auto ml automated machine learning like craze so for example uh, uh, this this paper the last paper in the references it actually learns with reinforcement learning like uh, the best combination of augmentations for that specific task so you can do uh, if you have enough computation power you don't even have to define those augmentation combinations but you can actually make the neural network learn or the model learn those things and some interesting ideas is that we augment always in the raw data, original data space, but you can actually augment on the latent space, latent space meaning that on the representation space. So this is an interesting idea that you can extrapolate, interpolate, add some noise on the learned representation space, like feature space, uh, and augment the data there. This, this, is, this is an interesting idea. And finally, 
AI models propagate or even reinforce social biases. For example, pick any language model, actually. It's, it's a couple of lines of code and you can perform this masked word prediction. So just mask a word and make the model predict that word. And if you, for example, have such a sentence, if you predict what, what is the probabilities of words coming instead of the mask, uh, and he is an engineer with the probability 79, and she it has much less probability, you will see there are hundreds of papers written about this bias in, in, in AI models, and uh, other words have maybe low, even lower probabilities. But this is obviously kind of a bias, a social bias kind of injected uh, into the AI model. And you can use data augmentation so you can replace he's and she's so you can make things more fair, more balanced in your training data to, to, to kind of counteract this uh, uh, bias in, in AI models. So that was it from me. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. It was my pleasure and I would be happy to answer your questions as much as I can. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Ogojan. That was really interesting. Yeah, actually, we have a couple of questions in the chat. I can read some of them. So yeah. first question from Oki Kiola. He or she asked about where is the data stored and what format is it stored in? Is it variably the same size as the actual image? Yeah, actually, uh as I mentioned, we don't want to store. We don't want to store the augmented data. So you you have your data. It's stored somewhere, uh, wherever your your system is in in your computer in a database. Uh, we want to apply augmentations like perturbations, changes on the fly during the neural network training. So we don't save those actually. So during the model training, we would like to. Uh, apply apply those changes and uh, the model learns from those so uh, typically we don't wanna we don't wanna save those augmentations all right I guess that's that's clear so another question from Xenia he or she asked about when when we are talking about state of the art in data augmentation what exactly does it mean uh, it's a bit uh, kind of the how how uh, machine learning research is done. I don't want to go into that discussion, is, but uh, we have well-known, let's say, data sets, for example, uh, COCO, ImageNet, et cetera, uh, for image classification, object detection, image segmentation, semantic segmentation, all these computer vision tasks. And uh, typically state-of-the-art means that having everything else equal, meaning the same neural network architecture, same training parameters, learning rate, et cetera, uh, they change the augmentation type uh, and test which one performs better. Uh, so that's what I meant. Uh, those new augmentations I introduced were the ones that performed more, the, the better, better than others. Uh, so one comment can be is that is this a fair comparison? Because when you change the change the data augmentation and maybe even the probabilities, the neural network parameters, you should change maybe the learning rate, etc. So um, this is I'm just like kind of stating what is what has been used. Uh, if you want to choose a couple of good augmentations, it was mix up, cut mix, and similar augmentations uh, currently used. All right. Thanks. So uh, Maria is asking, when dealing with smaller language groups like Finnish, Swedish, how would you augment content with NLP? Uh, so some of the NLP augmentations I mentioned, they can be applied to, to, to any language, meaning that you can uh, swap images, you can delete, swap words, characters, delete them. You can swap uh, sentences, insert insert characters. Uh, but for Finnish language specific, for example, you can use a word stammer, Finnish word stammer, uh, and uh, change the suffix because Finnish is such a word that such a language that you have um, lots of versions of a of a noun uh, like kolu, kolusta, kolusta, etc. So you can play with that uh, by just stemming stemming those words. Uh, 
Uh, or you can use a, for example, multilingual uh, language model, such as uh, multilingual BERT, to insert some, some words that actually make sense when you read the census, sentences, like contextual, contextualized word representations. Uh, or you can use actually a, a language model trained on Finnish language, for example, um, I think Turku University or Obo Academy has a Finnish BERT. So you can use even Finnish specific insertions uh, or deletion, in, like this kind of contextual word or language sentence insertions. Uh, that's what I would do. And you can always do back translation, translate to English and back to Finnish. Uh, I don't know if, if, if there's any machine translation model for that though. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So another question from Tommaso. He's asking, uh, how much data augmentation is too much? Especially in the NLP, I imagine that too much augmentation would eventually distort the meaning of the sentence. Uh, that's correct. That's that's for mm -hmm. sure. There's there's a uh, uh, there's such a point that you actually distort the image so much that it's it's completely from a different uh, sampled from a different statistical distribution in computer vision or NLP that's a fact so uh, I, I don't have an answer because that's a domain specific so problem specific thing uh, but the cool thing I introduced is that you keep the probabilities of each augmentations fixed and just play with the if you just play with the probability this one hyperparameter do you augment this this sample or not and just sweep it a bit uh, but play around with that a bit you will see more or less a cutoff point that it's too much so uh, do not over engineer that play with each probability of each augmentation because then then that's that's like a huge thing uh, computation wise so uh, with with couple of trainings you you will actually have a more or less a cut point that okay this much of probabilities is okay for data augmentation all right uh, we have another question in the context of uh, evaluating the data augmentation so Carita is asking if there is some sort of metrics that could be used as a guideline to evaluate the quality of data augmentation um, Typically, we, we, we would like to we evaluate our whatever we do in our choice of architecture, choice of uh, parameters, like our design, choice of algorithm. Uh, we will evaluate all that using a validation set, right? Validation data. So this is, this is the same. Uh, it's better if you cross-validate things, uh, sure. So basically, it's the same that that's why you never, you don't touch the validation data. You don't augment it. You keep the same uh, validation data and try out different augmentations or augmentation, use augmentation or not to compare that. Um, now, there's one recent paper that actually, it's a bit advanced, but they, they actually f try to find such a subset of data that if you try the augmentations on that, it will generalize the performance of that augmentation is like, this is better or this is better. That knowledge will generalize to the whole data set. So you run, you can run lots of trainings because it's a small subset of data, but they turn that into a learning problem itself. Uh, you might want to check that out. All right. Okay, so I guess the last question would be, so it's from Andrea and uh, it looks like data augmentation might also be used to add a bias within the data. Is it possible in your opinion? Yeah, that's possible. You should be careful about that. Yeah. The, the, thing, the thing about um, bias or fair, fairness, this fairness concept. So uh, there are several fairness metrics uh, that, that we can use to, to uh, to basically evaluate how fair two, mod two models are. And uh, the bummer is that uh, it's mathematically impossible to, to actually comply with all those fairness, fairness, let's say, metrics or constraints simultaneously. So um, it's kind of a Pareto thing that once, if you, are, if you make your model fair in some sense, 
it becomes unfair, more unfair in, in another sense. Uh, if you can email me, I can send you the paper that proves that actually. All right, sounds good. Yeah, I think we can take one last question. So Maxim is asking if you have any thoughts on pseudo labeling techniques. Uh, that is quite relevant with the current research also. Um, thanks for asking that. I, I didn't want to go into that because there's no time. So this whole pseudo labeling or self-supervision, uh, it, it's, it's quite important with the data augmentation simply because uh, you, you I, I'm not going, I don't have time to go explain what self-supervised, uh, let's say, pre-training is, but so, uh, for for people who don't know that, instead of creating um, annotating a lot of data, you want to use a weaker model, uh, basically to pseudo labels. So you predict the labels of your unannotated data and train with those labels. So so you constantly iteratively increase the uh, training size actually and couple of errors there and there, it, it's okay. So this is the logic there. And uh, this is pseudo labeling. Uh, I haven't used pseudo labeling and data augmentation in an industrial project that is in actually in production, but it's something I, I would like to, I would like to actually um, also experiment with because I would definitely use data augmentation in there. All right. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Ogojan. That was really thank you very much. 